This is F Society IRC Podcast, a Mr. Robot show. I'm your moderator of this chat, Marosha Shai. Please note that this podcast will have spoilers. In this chat, we will discuss the underlying themes, historical influences, inspirations, technology, ethical dilemmas, and other inspirational insights we have gleaned from each episode of the first season of Mr. Robot. We will be bringing on experts to share their insights and knowledge with us in each chat. We will also be reviewing each episode of the first season, as well as the second season when it premieres. We are awake, we are free, we are alive for F Society IRC Podcasts. Hello, F Society RC chat. This is your moderator, Roja Scheib, with another review of Mr. Robot. This is Season 2, Episode 10, Hidden Process. This episode, oh my god, does not even cover it. Uh, For this episode, I'm just going to go pretty much in chronological order to all the events that have happened, so that way we can keep things straight, because things, as the episode progresses, kind of blended in together. But wow. Um, before we get started, I will say that there will be two theory episodes this week. One will be about the Washington uh, Township plan. It will be the part two, which basically will uh, kind of amend the theory I already have out there, plus kind of little pat on the back with the e-coin theory minus the quantum computer component, as well as the theory that's been going around online since pretty much season one about Mr. Robot, Elliot, and a third personality. So let's get started. We begin with a book, and that book is The Last Honest Man by Terry Colby. Uh, he is in the office of Philip Price. He is giving an advanced copy to Philip Price, and it's a very strange conversation in general what's going on here. Um, as Terry Colby is stated very early on, uh, or she said late on in season one, and they kind of give us a, a little recap of that conversation. You know, business people, the people up on the top, the 1% that Elliot's trying to take down, they don't hold grudges like, I guess you could say, the normal people do. So him sitting in the office of Philip Price, a man that he was part of a, a lawsuit, if you will, that just got settled, possibly still talking to the feds about the Washington Township cover-up and making testimony. They're, they're sitting across from one another like it's no big deal. And, you know, they're having a conversation. Colby's saying, you know, kind of a bit of a shot, uh, uh, a shot against the bow against Trump, that his book is selling better than Trump's, that, you know, the dirt that he knows would be enough for him to be a, a vice presidential ticket, if you will, if Trump were ever to run. Philip Price is saying, you know, <clears throat> politicians are puppets. You don't want to do that. And then they start talking about the real purpose or, or reason why Philip Price has Terry Kobe in there. And that is to get Terry Kobe to convince his friend Winston Campbell to abstain his vote at the UN. So that way China can annex the Congo. And Terry Kobe, the character, even calls it out as he's kind of leaving the office when they're having this conversation as Phil Pice basically press pressures Terry Kobe to do this is that he's trading that somehow Price is the most powerful man in the world and he's trading countries like they're trading cards. And Price is like, yeah, they're just you know, lines and borders. That's, that's what I do. And he was, and then Price goes in his speech about being the most powerful man in the room. That's what drove him. If he wasn't the most powerful man in the room, he was going to make sure he was. And there's maybe one or two rooms in this world where he's not. And that drives him. That irks him, if you will. And he also said maybe. So there might be three rooms that he's not the most powerful man in the room. And that's what's his motivation. But but Terry Kobe's like, he he's like, you know, the Obama administration is not going to be known to be Obama, the president, is not going to be known as the guy who's going to gift the Congo to China, but the way Price is going to have it played is going to be done because the investors are just going to stay and the UN vote is going to go through anyway. And that's pretty much how the UN Security Council vote goes. Unless someone vetoes it and votes no, most of those votes go through. There's no in or way around it. That's pretty much how it goes. If you one person vetoes it, that just pretty much kills the, the council vote, if you will. But if you're staying and, and everyone else goes yay, 
or abstains or doesn't vote on the subject, then it just pretty much goes through. So China is going to get Congo, which is what White Rose wanted. And by having the Congo, it's part of some type of plan or deal that will enable and allow for E-Corp to eventually get those uh, loans from China and secure its place and once again back into global domination, if you will. So we end with basically Terry Colby agreeing to doing the Winston Campbell pressure for abstaining as a vote, having the conversation about Phil Price's motivation of being the most powerful man in the room. And we end that part to go back to Elliot. And we open with Elliot and Joanne Wellick. And Yeah, we're, just, uh, we're kind of bouncing around here, but basically, she t- calls him Ollie, uh, which is the name that he gave Joanne when uh, they first met. Uh, she pretty much knows that's not what his name is. All she knows is he works for her husband. Uh, Mr. Sutherland, he gets into the car. Uh, Mrs. Sutherland, of course, is not for this, but uh, before Elliot gets in, Joanne says that if he had done his job, they would be having this conversation. So basically either it's finding Ty- Tyra Wellick himself through his people or possibly even picking up Elliot uh, at the prison because that same car was there. Mr. Sutherland is very con- concerned about what the FBI might um, make conclusions if they see Elliot with them. But at this point, I don't think Joanne really cares too much about that. So they're at this, uh, they're driving, and they're at uh, Joanne Wellick's place, and it's absolutely silent. And I remember this, I had this conversation a very long time ago with a salesperson that basically said, the first person who speaks loses. And at this point in time, Joanne is waiting, and she's just staring at Elliot. And Elliot's having the conversation in his head with not only the audience, but Mr. Robot, where he feels that. Joanne could hear his thoughts, and Mr. Robot's like, I think she can see me. And so Mr. Robot kind of makes the move to leave, but it's actually Elliot leaving, and she says, you can't leave. Which is very interesting, because Elliot, the persona, if you will, Elliot didn't move. So we're, we're kind of seeing the break where people are actually something that we as an audience haven't been really seeing people acknowledge, the difference between Elliot and Mr. Robot. Within Elliot's circle, it, it seems like they're not acknowledging the split so much, maybe because they can't tell the difference, or because when Elliot and Mr. Robot split from one another, it's more clean. But here, there was an acknowledgement that, you know, Elliot was moving as Mr. Robot, if you will. So. So Joanne Wellick tells this amazing story about Tyra Wellick where she basically got him to fuck another woman so she can have that woman's pair of earrings. And these earrings are the most inexpensive item that she has on her. Um, Mind you, that includes her lipstick. Lipstick, makeup, everything. The the Kubis and Zurich earrings that she's wearing um, are the most expensive items. And there's she always, these are the little gifts that Tyra Willett gives her. And we've seen her, seen Tyra Willett give Joanne Willett gifts. Uh, that she knows that Tyra Willett will do anything to remain and stay alive. And that Elliot, whom she knows is working with her husband, is going to help her find Tyra Willett. And Elliot is a little confused because she's saying that she's getting these phone calls on, these calls on this phone. And she gives Elliot the phone. And she's like, there's a black number, but I know it's him. And Elliot's like, have you spoken to him? And she's like, no. But he's, but he is talking to me. He's communicating with me and you're going to find him for me. And Mr. Robot's like, these people are blood simple. She's crazy. You know, Elliot's contemplating whether or not to tell her that Joanne Wallach is dead, but he knows if he does that, he's probably going to be dead himself. So he agrees to help. But he gets taken by Mr. Sutherland, and they're going. And Elliot, for the first time, is actually kind of 
acknowledging his surroundings, if you will. He's seen kind of the breakdown of what his revolution has done, all the trash pile up, the foreclosed homes, the uh, businesses going out, the, the kind of despair that's in the air. And Mr. Robot's talking about how, how they need to get out of the situation because Tyrell, well, like, you know, is kind of crazy. His wife is crazy. And they shouldn't really be doing this. They need to get home. And Elliot tells Mr. Sutherland and the driver, the bodyguard, that he needs to take him to, uh, I forgot what the name of the electronic store, the electronic store. And Mr. Sutherland is like, no, we're going to your apartment. And he goes, you know, it's going to take weeks, maybe months for my stuff to come back. I need equipment now. If you want it done by tonight, you need to go to this place so I can buy the stuff that we need. And so Mr. Sutherland takes him to the electronic store. So meanwhile, while Elliot is doing all this, Darlene is at home. We find out what the knock is, and it's it's Cisco and Vincent. Vincent is the when the season premiere episode happened, and uh, Darlene took over uh, Susan Jacobs' home. Vincent was the man with the missing leg, talking to Darlene. The unknown man talking to her. He's part of the. It, they've been given different names, uh, the 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 Bernie uh, Bros, the Bernie F Society, uh, just Bro F Society, Frat F Society, but basically that particular wing that was down in D.C. that Darlene had given the mission to the other the, to one of the other crew members to take over, and this is going to be part of a sequence of fuck ups that both Darlene and Cisco have done that has gotten to where we saw at the end of the episode. But we'll stick with just this episode's fuck up, which is Cisco's mistake by taking the cab straight home. He didn't do any of the, the, what's it called? Uh, the security precautions that they've been doing where they would take a cab here, take a car there, take a, take trains, subways, buses, walk, you know, zigzag through the city to get back to a place so they would lose any type of tail. Cisco didn't do that. This guy, Vincent, is like was on the couch at Susan Jacobs' house. He looks really fucked up. He looks like he has internal bleeding. Uh, he still somehow still has his leg. Darlene is concerned that he has a tracker. She's concerned about because he knows her face and was going to be talking. Cisco's like, y- you're not going to kill this guy. You, you, you're you not going to do that. That's what Darlene wanted to do. And that's probably what Darlene should have done. Is either She should have uh, killed this guy. Or done what Cisco initially suggested, which was just, was just drop him at the hospital and and go. Um, but you know, Cisco also kind of like choose Darlene out because Darlene's still contemplating of just you know killing this dude because he knows too much. She doesn't know what's happened to the DC crew. Doesn't even know how he got to Susan Jacobs house, and she choose him choose him out. And I kind of didn't quite like this conversation because. A lot of what is happening is not Darlene's fault. I will talk about these fuck ups, but he chews her out about not being a leader. That the that the crew of the F Society thing where they did they did the hack and that's brilliant, but they've been fumbling around in the aftermath and that she's not special. Uh, this is not some cry for justified, you know, justified killing somebody, that they're they they were all fucked up, really. And, and this is true in the sense, because what happened was because one Darlene and this is Elliot's fault, didn't know what Sage 2 was. She didn't know the full plan of Sage 2. So she's operating on either a decoy Sage 2 plan or some kind of ad hoc plan that she knows was the intent that Elliot had when they first had that conversation about keeping E Corp um, on the ropes, keeping them on the knees and not allowing to, allowing them to um, basically rebuild themselves. She's thinking with the humiliating E Corp through, you know, the ransomware, the burning of the cash, the dropping of the balls um during the house vote, uh flying a drone into the Capitol building that and any other mis- mischief stuff that they've been doing is keeping E Corp uh at bay, on the ropes, uh in the news as a negative, negative, negative and trying to break the confidence that people have in the company. But it's it by leading that she she's she sort of like let it 
in a way she did need it. I, I didn't think don't think she led him in the wrong way. I just think she didn't have the full information. The second fuck up thing she did was instead of going down to DC and running the DC operation that she obviously planned herself, she left it to somebody else's hands. And the reason why she left it in somebody else's hands is was because of the because she didn't know about stage two, the shooting that occurred in China uh caused the FBI to leave the E Corp building. I imagine the attempt to sell on that whole uh owning the FBI's phones was a plan that they were working on to, to attain, to use social engineering and taking their time to do. Because as Darlene has stated when she was trying to get Elliot to convince Angela to help them, it was there was a fortress. It was going to take time to social engineer their way in. And they were probably being cautious. They were probably doing it the right way. The, a, a plan was in place. And even when they brought Angela in, they were trying to teach her how to hack. But they had to accelerate their timetable. So they had to get it to the FBI and on their phones and do the DC operation at the same time. Instead of killing the DC operation or focus or giving the um, owning the cell phones to Moby or Trenton and going down to DC herself and taking care of that, she she let the ball go. She dropped it, if you will. And because of that, that that decision to continue on forward and try to do it looks like a couple of multiple things at once. She not only lost focus, as you saw with the Susan Jacobs thing, which I think was her intent all along, was eventually kill Susan Jacobs. But let's, say, let's give her the benefit of the doubt, and she lost focus, and Susan Jacobs, you know, just happening to come into the home, which is a, an opportunity, if you will, a convenient opportunity for her. But this split focus thing that she had um, is causing all these, these fuck-ups. The, the tape, the fact that Cisco just ran back home, all these things is a result of the loss of focus, of loss of not sticking to point, sticking to mission, and maybe in a sense not being the very special great leader that Elliot is, and just being just an ordinary leader, uh, working with what she can and doing what she can with the resources that she has. So meanwhile, and there's going to be a lot of meanwhiles, um, Dom's at the smart house, the Susan Jacobs house. She's there with other FBI agents. There's another FBI agent in charge. Apparently, there was a car chase two days ago, uh, and it has to do with the uh, drone that hit the Capitol building. Uh, they're calling them the teabaggers. Apparently, they were in Maryland. They gave chase. One of them escaped. They all talked about, because they all got caught alive, talked about coming back to Susan Jacobs' house. And she says one of the guys matches the description on her, on uh, Dom's co- codename case. And Dom's kind of pissed. She goes, like, why did we just step back and wait for more people to show up? Why did we burn this house? And the FBI agent's like, well, you know, the director, after everything's going on, is being more aggressive, and so this is what we're doing. So the FBI agents are just coming through the house. Who knows what they're going to find? Um, they know that Susan Jacobs can't be reached, so Susan Jacobs is missing. So there's that as well. And now that house is burned. But most importantly, what it's found out is that a witness saw a cab and two men get into the cab, and they were able to describe Cisco's face, the guy from the Herconian case. Uh, I think it's important to note that, you know, Dom... I'm going to have to apologize because last episode I thought she was dark army. I thought she was being a little extra and doing her job to make appearances seem that she was, you know, Miss FBI agent and that she might be the she in um, Philip Price's and White Rose's conversation. But it looks like maybe the she is either the she must be Angela. But she's like, she's like, she's gumshoeing it here. She's trying to, she's trying to do a job and there seems to be all those like either bureaucratic obstacles or someone's actually kind of standing in her way. And we'll talk about who's standing in her way of her trying to, you know, get her man. So we get back to Elliot and Mr. Robot's talking and Elliot's like, she's just a, you know, she's a grieving wife. Uh, the place they're going to is a micro center to get the hardware. 
And here's a bit of a shout out to my little theory about eCoin being worth more. You can see on the price tag of the laptop that Elliot uh, is picking up. If you use eCoin, the cryptocurrency regulated by Evil Corp, you get 20% off to use it. Uh, Mr. Robot makes a point, you know, isn't that a bit of ironic rich um, that a cryptocurrency regulated by Evil Corp, you know, gives back to the reason why we're doing what we're doing and we need to go home. Another thing that Mr. Robot keeps emphasizing is the fact that they need to get home. Uh, Elliot is picking up, you know, prepaid phones, cables, notebook, and then the phone rings, the phone that Joanne Wellick gave him, that is the phone that Tara Wellick, she believes, gave him, or gave her, and then he's calling from. And as soon as Elliot picks up the phone, Mr. Robot disappears as there's breathing on the other line. And Elliot says, hello. And the person hangs up. And he, he talks to us. He goes, did you hear that? Did you see that? And then he wonders why. And he walks around thinking that maybe there might be somebody in the in the shop with them. And then he realizes, too, that Mr. Robot is gone. And he's beginning to doubt whether or not, you know, is Tyra Wellick dead? Why did Mr. Robot disappear? So he gets home. He gets back to his place. Gets to work to setting up the equipment in the high power attendant. And while he's doing it, it intercuts with a scene with, um, Darlene and Cisco again, as they are, you know, as they are at the hospital, they did in fact do the right thing and they dropped Vincent off. Cisco was like, you know, we didn't have to stay, but Darlene was like, yeah, we, we kind of do. You know, I owe that to him. And they start talking, you know, and she's like, you know, talk a little bit about stage two. Cisco's like, you know, I, he doesn't know what stage two is. And she realizes that she's not special like Elliot. And she tells a story about being kidnapped on Coney Island. That her father did like this uh, family Alderson trip to Coney Island. And that she wanted to ride a roller coaster, but she was too small to do it. And then just her, Elliot and her father went on. And for some reason or other, she got separated from her mom. She's wandering around. And this woman just picked her up. This kind of old, weird looking woman, if you will. And took her home and asked her what she wanted to eat, and she said it was the first time anyone had ever asked her anything for anything. Her parents never did that. She got what she wanted. She she was laying in the bed. It looked like a kind of like one of those princess beds, and she, she was happy. And uh, she was afraid. She was afraid that as soon as she woke up, she was going to be at home, and she wasn't going to be at this woman's place. But she was. She was at this woman's place, and she was even happy, more happier because she didn't want to go home. And then... The police show up and take her away. She never saw that woman again, woman again, but she often wondered what her life would be like if she stayed with that woman. But then she realized she wouldn't have Elliot. And that's when she talked about how, you know, she's not that special. She knows all of this is because of Elliot and her trying to be, be like Elliot or be like that person that, that person like Elliot is, is really not who she is. And so nurse comes out and tells them, hey, you know, what's up with this guy? How what went on with him? His wounds aren't fresh. They said they just went to his place and found him like that. Um, they said that in an hour, you know, they'll know what his status is. But right now, you know, his injuries are pretty severe. So sister goes like, we have an hour to kill. Why don't, why don't we leave? Um, a thing to note about this scene is, you know, it's a very touching personal story. It speaks to kind of psychosis of Darlene. She does have a bit of a self-doubt, self-doubt issue when it comes to measuring up to her brother. It's very obvious that she was severely abused as a child for her to want to be, you know, somewhere else, to be kid to stay with the person who kidnapped her, uh, speaks the volumes to that family dynamic, or at least to the level of abuse that she got from her mom. The other thing was that um that conspiracy theorist guy was on the television. Uh, they're kind of out in the open here. They're not really covering their faces or covering their tracks. Who knows if they gave their real names when they dropped their friend off. I mean, they're they're kind of making some mistakes here. They should have just dropped Vincent off and left to kind of prevent them from being tied to him. Uh, you, you know, gone back to Cisco's house and wiped the place down. Just pretty much got out of Dodge here. Until they can figure things out, either contacted Elliot or hooked these up. The fact that Darlene didn't contact Elliot speaks kind of volumes. And I don't know if it's 
because she's been operating at such a mode without Elliot that what normally would have been her instinct to go to her brother wasn't there. So as we're intercutting here in this story, we um, we get Elliot setting up shop. He's getting a wicker from Angela to meet up. He's doing his thing that he has to do. He's downloading Kali Linux to boot up um, the operating system on the notebook. He has a fax machine that he's going to spoof because he's going to social engineer his way into the phone companies as an NYPD um, police officer. He's tracking down all the information. Um, from what I've read online, everyone, or pretty much everything he's doing is pretty exacting as usual. Uh, he half, the, the guy that he's with, Sutherland, half wants it to be him on the phone, half wants it not to be him. He starts uh, talking to Elliot a little bit as they're, they're going through this process. Talks about his clients, and one of them being a first chair uh, violinist uh, with uh, the Met, I guess. And talks about how he like to masturbate. And he says, you know, he's had weird kind of clients before. And Elliot's like turning around, and you know, he doesn't, he doesn't do these personal one-on-one things. It's not his thing. So he kind of like tunes the guy out. But he asks us as the audience to kind of look for what Mister Robot may have hidden in the apartment, and it's kind of like a VR 360 Facebook type of a deal as we're going around the apartment looking for uh, places and things. It seems like there might be something hidden in the mail. There's a couple of different theories on that. Oh, we'll get to that when we get to the end of this bit here. But he asks us for to look for it. Um, Elliot eventually gets back into, back into the mode, kind of tunes the guy out, gets back to the plan. He's pretending to be the uh, the detective. Is stating that um, a suicidal person keeps calling his ex girlfriend from a blocked number, so they're trying to find the current location of the person. They find it is uh, 92 East 82nd Street, New York, New York, uh, which is that kind of an actual location, kind of not. Mister Sutherland knows the location, and he's like it, how accurate it is, and only it's like twelve within twelve meters. It seems like Mr. Sutherland kind of freaks out. He's like, God damn it. Takes a picture of the screen. He goes, he wouldn't be calling from that house. And then he leaves. So now Elliot's alone. Uh, He gets another uh, wicked message from Angela about meeting up. And so he's going to go and meet up with Angela. So we have Dom. While this is going, uh, she gets into Cisco's place. She meets meets up with the, oh no, actually before that. She gets to back to the FBI headquarters from the smart house of Susan Jacobs, and she's going to her boss, Santiago. She goes, you know, we have fresh evidence on this guy, and he goes, we're gonna put a bolo out. And she goes, if you put a bolo out, the Dark Army will, will kill him. And he's he's like, not this again. She goes, we already lost Marrakesh, and Santiago says, we're going to the media. media. We're gonna use the Ollie Parker sketch, which is the first sketch of uh, Cisco about putting the CD in the place. And he tells her to meet up with Agent Thompson, so that way they can coordinate things with with, uh, with him. And Dom's not having it. She doesn't understand why Santiago wants to do it this way, but he's like, he's already made the phone calls. He's sending out the bolo. Uh, I think Santiago, like I stated, like when uh, the initial FBI shooting was happening, bit of a weasel guy, seemed a bit nervous. He might be Dark Army. It's seeming more and more hinting that he possibly might be the informant within Dark Army, passing information. The fact that he already burned the Susan Jacobs house, the fact that he wants to go to the media with Polo. Not only that, but you have to also remember the, the Dark Army also owns the FBI phones as well. So all that information is getting out there. So there's multiple ways that not only Santiago can sabotage and pass information onto the Dark Army when it comes to the F9 hack, but... The Dark Army is going to know. Dark Army is going to know rather rapidly that Cisco has been burnt, which means that he is, as Dom's going to say, it's going to get get coming. So Dom gets to Cisco's place. They have the badge number. They they have the name, his actual real name. They're going through his house, and because Cisco went directly to his place with the cab, they you know they got they just got owned all all of uh, the tapes, the equipment. His computer, her computer are all there. So they're going to get burned. They're going to get tied to the F9 hack, being part of F Society. They're pretty much screwed. So as they're going through, you know, Cisco's place, Dom gets a call. She meets up with her boss at the hospital. The bolo worked out. Turns out the one of the guys, the, the two the, that Cisco dropped off, the guy that was at the smart house there. They also find out that um, he was with somebody, a woman. San Diego is trying trying to tell 
Time to slow a roll. We're going to go through the tapes and figure things out. Uh, they're probably long gone because of the bolo. And, and Dom's just not buying it. San Diego is go, goes off to go get the tapes to look at security footage. They obviously have secured Vincent because he's one of the uh, the men from the, 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 as they call them, the teabaggers. And Dom's just, she's just in the lobby, just swirling around, staring at everything, trying to figure out, you know, why they were there. Why did they just not just drop the guy off at the hospital? If they're wanted, if his face has been plastered all over the media, why, why did they stay? Why did they sit there? Why did they wait? How come it was like only a while ago that they, you know, she's just trying to run through their head. What's going on? What's going on? She eventually asks the nurse, she goes, um, why did you wait so long to call? And then the nurse is kind of a little freaked out. She goes, you're not in trouble. I'm just trying to figure this out. She goes, well, probably because with or with the other nurse that was coming on, turns the TV onto the news. I mean, Dom pointed out the TV's like right there. It's normally not on the news. And Dom's like, okay, they don't know the bolo's out. So that means they're probably co- close, that they're, they're going to come back. And she's looking around and she knows she's not going to get San Diego's permission to vacate the hospital to make it, you know, kind of a honey trap. So she goes around. She goes, they're not far if they're coming back. And she starts looking for them. So Angela and Elliot, and it's Angela, so she's freaked out she's despondent they're meeting in the in the subway car ellie apologizes that he wouldn't get to her sooner and the first thing angela asks is why did he start f society and this is where the part where a lot of people are hinging on the fact and it's been a, some, a theory for a while that there might be three personalities with elliot mr robot the personality we currently see on the show and then maybe the original elliot now, for a while there some people thought he might be tyler wellick or tyler wellick might show up as a personality I don't believe that to be the case. I do believe that there is original Elliot. I talked about it a little bit last season, but the the reactions that were going across his face seemed like three separate different types of reactions. And then Elliot responds to her and saying, you know, I didn't want to get you involved. I didn't, I didn't want you to be part of this at all. And Angela just kind of looks at him and she goes, I'm going to turn myself in. I'm going to say that I, I plan to defend himself. I'm going to own up to what she has done. And Ellie starts going in his monologue. She's like, I, I hid in a cage and while everyone else is dealing with everything that's going on, the consequences. And she's like, she starts talking to him, like, you know, we're a long way from, you know, back to the future to getting high. He goes, we never actually really did that, did we? And she goes, no. You know, she, and she also says, you know, remember when you were at the Queen, I found you at the Queen's Museum and you were yelling at the staff because they couldn't see who, who you saw? Was that your dad or someone else? And now they just, just kind of silent. She goes, you, you can't work with him. You can't trust him, Elliot. Uh, don't trick yourself into doing this. And Joe's like, I'm going to meet with my lawyer. I'm going to do this. This is, it, this is something that can be done. And she tells him, you probably should get off as the subway is closing. And they hug, and then Angela kisses him, and he beats. Um, I know a lot of people don't think this is, like, within character for Angela. Some think she was already with the FBI, and she already done it. I don't think that's the case. I think when Dom came to her home after... She went to the nu- nuclear regulatory uh, place. I think she was super freaked. I think she realized just how deep she was with anything and that she could not do things the right way. She couldn't do good within Evil Corp. That she may have possibly almost been killed that night. And then she has the FBI person come to her home and telling her that somebody might snatch her from the middle in the middle of the night on the street. So I think she's completely freaked. I think her going to her lawyer... And owning up to stuff is probably the smart play for her. She's always about the smart play. I think she really wanted to do good by stopping Evil Corp. But I think she's one of the few people besides Cisco and even um, to some extent Moby that realize the extent of what it is that they're doing. And she's telling Elliot about how they can't fight them. That's why she's turning them in. That they're always are going to win. That they're always going to get to. And there's no way to beat, in essence, the system. The system's going to win. 
and she's conceding to that. She she wants to live. She wants to survive. And this is the thing that she thinks she will not only allow her to survive and live, but maybe pull out of it somehow. Another key thing about this is it goes far as the extent that, you know, it was kind of hinted last season when it was revealed to the audience that the person Elliot's been talking to, Mr. Robot, was his father. That Angela's known about his personality and stuff like that, but maybe she didn't know exactly who he was talking to. But she's known about his, you know, it's been Darlene and Angela's party pretty much have known who it is he's been talking to. And I think it's coming to Angela's realization that perhaps maybe these personalities are not people he should be talking to, and that it's not a good thing that he's talking to, in essence, the ghost of his father. Because look where they're at. They're, they're talking to each other in a subway. Another bit about the conversation is I thought maybe whatever was hidden that Mr. Robot wanted to get might be in the Back to the Future DVD case or something like that because Elliot does, or maybe Elliot slash Robot does like to put stuff, hidden audio files and CDs. So maybe this time around he did it for a DVD and his mark Back to the Future. But Elliot leaves, and as he's leaving, uh, two people approach Angela and looks like what she dreaded is, is going to happen to her. She's going to get snatched. It kind of looks like people are saying they're both of them are identified, but it kind of looks like the guy that she was dating that was also an FBI agent might be the person who's about to snatch her. I don't think it's Dark Army. I think this is Operation Berenstein. I think they're they're snatching people, if you will. Or it could be Dark Army. Um, but I think it's an aspect of the government that is snatching the, the five nine hackers, if you will. Again, like I said, the government or the, the power structure needs to present to the people uh, the guilty parties, if you will, so everything can get wrapped up in a nice little package. And I think there's a bit of a scramble on, on who is going to be part of this package. And I don't know if it's Dark Army manipulating this, Evil Corp manipulating this, or something that Elliot had already conceive as part of stage two but Angela looks like she's been getting snatched up here so we get back to Dom and it looks like uh, Dom is looking around in the around the hospital area there's a brownout um, she talks to a woman and finding a place to eat looks like a lot of places are closed up she says there's a place five blocks away so Dom's running towards it uh, trying to figure out how you know trying to find Cisco and Darlene so Darlene and Cisco are at this place called Lupe's. Um, they don't know about the bolo that was put out in Cisco because they, they, they're they not on their social media or cell phones. They're kind of in their own little world. This Lupe place doesn't have like a radio blasting overhead or uh, like a local or t- television. So they have no idea what's going on. So they're talking. Darlene's just running through scenarios saying, you know, she has a mini stash hacker space that we can go to. Uh, we need to find Trenton and Moby kind of basically leave Vincent at the hospital and not go back to it. Go back to his place, wipe it down. She's trying to be calm about it. Maybe to even make a run for it, if you will. And he's like, this was like, no. We're not going to do anything like that. We're going to just chill. Maybe the best decision is not making anything. And, and not pushing this. You know, not making any decisions because some of the decisions she has made have not quite worked out. Even the decisions he has made hasn't worked out. I mean, he went directly from the smart house to his home. Um, but at this point in time, they don't seem to be panicking because I don't think they know to the extent that they're trapped, if you will. So he takes he takes a, a fry or something off of her plate, and she's like, what are you doing? If you wanted fries, you should have ordered some fries. You know I don't go for that family shit. And then he takes a sip of her drink, and they, they're kind of, they're calm and calm. She, she's not going through these things. Things that probably the proper decision was to immediately go, like I said, back to Cisco's place and wipe wipe his place down, go to her hacker space, and try to find Trent and Moby. So we're now at Secluded Call, if you will, the big chicken of this, this episode. Whew. So Dom finds them. She's outside. This is all one shot. She calls it in. She calls it in. She's a cop. And that's what you do. She calls it in. She goes into um, the restaurant. I have seen stuff online where people have cleaned up the audio about what's going on. Um, I can't say for sure because it went into the show actually completely pre- presented to us. Um, I'm not. I'm not saying it's not true. I'm just. I'm just. I'm not going to 
go as as it being truthful for the moment. But just by the body language, like if someone were to come in, even with Dom's awkwardness and her way of uh, having social interactions, were to cause Cisco and Darlene to pause for a moment at the table. The moment she said FBI, I would imagine they were to run around, but they didn't. And so I'm going to be curious of what the diner conversation is. But we can see, because our view is from the outside, that a motorcycle is coming up. And it's obvious it's a, it's a dark army. You know, there's two people on the motorcycle. They park in front of, across the way from the diner. You could actually see as the crosswalk actually c- counts down from green. And then it counts down, like, the red is counting down. And this guy has the same type of weapon that was used at the FBI shooting in China. Pulls it out. Dom sees and Dom drops, which we'll get back to in a second. And it looks like Cisco's dead. It looks like Darlene's possibly dead. But this the, the hitman fires upon into the diner. Possibly other diner people who are dead as well. And um, gets them. Dom pops back up. Hits the guy twice, it looks like. He might got hit by the leg, possibly in the chest. Police sirens are coming because they're coming to the Lubeck location because it was already called in. The guy, the, the, the guy on the motorcycle waiting for the shooter takes off. The shooter, getting surrounded by the cops, pops himself in the head. Dom rushes out. She's got blood on her face. Somebody's dead. She's yelling, green, 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 FBI, FBI. She's holding her badge and her gun up, and she's, she's running towards the camera, looking around, looking towards the direction of the motorcycle. That is the end of the episode. This episode in general, was, like, super tense. Just the way they intercut everything from the the little mini hack that Elliot did from his meeting with Joanna to Cisco and Darlene dropping Vincent off and then leaving in the diner scene. Ugh. I'll say this. Uh, the, like I said, I don't apologize and say the Dom is not the Dark Army agent. It looks like it might be her boss, Santiago. Then again, um, the Dark Army do own the FBI phones, just like F Society did. They may have been monitoring as soon as the bolo went out. They probably sent agents out to Cisco's location, to the Susan Jacobs house, and then eventually tracked everything down to the hospital. As soon as, you know, a bolo was reached, they probably went to the hospital, started circling around looking for Cisco and Darlene. Primarily, most likely Cisco because his face. Uh, the fact that Dom, like, just second time in a row, a drop to the ground. It makes me wonder um, if Don maybe it turns out has some background in some military history, if you will, because even a, those FBI agents when shots were fired didn't drop as quickly as Dom did. Um, just someone as a military brat and has been around with military people. There are reflexes for certain things, especially combat soldiers. Like when it comes to that, I've seen it happen. The people had uh, PSD episodes where, you know, Something went off and they literally hit the ground. Like one minute they're standing, one second they're standing, the next second they're just on the ground flat. Like you can't believe they moved that fast. Uh, even given their, their their age and height and weight and all that, I I would be would be curious if that's the case with her because she was just as soon as that gunman was at the window, she was down to the ground. It was so quick, and then she popped up very quickly. Then again, it could be FBI training. It could be completely FBI training. But I was just curious the gap between when she left law school and left the uh, individual that proposed her and then wound up in the FBI if, a, a period of that time. Because it's very clear that Dom is much older than a lot of the characters there. She's more experienced. She's been doing her job for a while. She's somewhere in her... I know the actress is um, probably like 30, 32. Maybe she's somewhere around the same age. It would be interesting to know if... Or a bit older, if you will, if she... Maybe it might be 35 or something. It might have spent some time in the military. You know, then Moby um, might have. There's some hints to that, I think. Not positive, I'm sure, on that. But it's a possibility. There's something that uh, Don has done. What are the wrap-ups when we talk about this episode? Only two episodes left. Um, my understanding is they're splitting. The season finale is going to be one episode, and then the next episode's two-parter. There's still a lot of stuff in the air. There's, you know... Is Tyra Wellick alive? What What is that place that um, Mr. Shiloh is like? Is that he would be calling there from there? Um, is it somebody you know all along messing with 
uh, Joanne Willick? Is it like Scott Knowles or Terry Colby or somebody else? Uh, what is stage two? Um, how does Elliot play a part in stage two since it is his plan? Who exactly snatched Angela? Is Darlene alive? Is I, I don't think Cisco's alive, but is Cisco alive? And what's next for Dom? We know, you know, she's she's kind of got her man, but he's dead. Is she going to figure out that maybe possibility that her boss sabotaged her case or somehow Dark Army has a mole? Where's Trent and Moby? There's these, these are the type of questions going on. What is, what is stage two? Why does White Rose want the Congo and the Washington Township plant? And how is it all tied with the evil corpse domination of the financial market? I will talk about some of those in the, in the theories, but these are the type of questions that are being presented for the season finale. And who knows if any of them or more questions are going to be, be asked uh, when these two episodes drop. So well, that is it for now. Uh, thank you very much for listening and logging on. Thank you for joining us on this chat. You can find us on all podcast outlets such as iTunes, Google Play, SoundCloud, MixCloud, and any podcast catcher. You can reach us on Twitter at F Society IRC, our website at fsocietyirc.xyz. You can email us at fsocietyirc at protonmail.com. Our music attributes are under the Creative Commons license number three the intro music is by monk the song is called the planet shakers the paragraph remix our outro music is by trevet halbeka and the song is elta as well as Quana, and the song is demons you can support the show either via the qr code in the show notes by contributing with a bitcoin or through paypal and there's a link in the show notes where you can pay file me under herosia shite if you're very into uh, cryptocurrency, you can also tip me through a uh, chain chip at Herosia or at one name at Herosia. Thank you very much for listening and look forward to hearing from you. Logging off. This has been a Herosia Shad Space Odyssey Network production.